for some words that I made on social media that were obviously misconstrued. And in this day and age where we're trying to blur the lines between reality and, and, and what's you know, f fiction and, and non nonfiction, sometimes people's feelings get hurt. So our stance and feelings were hurt, so tweets were put down, uh, were taken down, and I wanted to offer an apology until yesterday I saw that you and your wife were on TMZ Live and you were capitalizing on this shit and you're trashing my name in public. Yeah, my fucking name too. This is the first time it's coming to you. Fucking trash. What are you fucking Talk about the Impact Hall of Fame. Uh, that turned out to be quite the eventful evening last night. I was live in attendance at the Impact Wrestling Hall of Fame ceremony, uh, and and really it was a really nice tribute to one of the TNA originals. And I I didn't really think about this, but he mentioned this during his speech. The first TNA original to go into the Impact Hall of Fame. Uh, and one of the truly nice guys, like genuinely nice people in the wrestling business by all accounts, everybody, not just that we heard from last night, but just people over time who have talked about this guy uh, have never said a bad word about him. And that is, of course, the monster Abyss, a.k.a. Joseph Park. Uh, we did not get Joseph Park last night, <clears throat> even though he, he was, you know, dressed up for the occasion. Uh, but he, he made passing reference to his brother. Uh, and it was funny, too, because they did a video, and uh, one of the people in the video who was, who was uh, saying nice things about Abyss was, in fact, Joseph Park. He was talking about his brother. Uh, so that was, that was nice to see. It was uh, very nice to see. Um, the venue. Let me talk about the venue here for a little bit before I get into some of the other details. So the venue was Mikhail's Bar and Grill. Uh, in Midtown, and there were a lot of people when I first mentioned this on the podcast a few weeks ago who were poking fun, you know, oh, they're having a Hall of Fame ceremony at basically at a bar in the middle of New York City. Yeah, but you know what? I've, I've talked about the WWE Hall of Fame before and how I just absolutely cannot stand some of the people who go to those ceremonies. Uh, I, I don't think I've gone to a WWE Hall of Fame in, in probably the last couple of years, whenever the one that Kurt Angle went into. Uh, maybe that was last year. That was the last one I went to. I definitely didn't go this year, uh, and I'm not planning on going next year either. And not the only reason, but part of that reason is just because I have grown to despise uh, a lot of the people who go to these shows and and the chanting and just at 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 times where it is so inappropriate to be doing that. But the argument is, well, they paid for their ticket. How is that any different than a wrestling show? So instead of wrestling, they're they're in you know they're on stage talking. People paid their ticket. They should be able to do what they want and say what they want. And to me, that that's that's true to a point anyway, as far as the wrestling shows go. But I, I do think that the Hall of Fame shows, or let's say in the middle of a really, you know, emotional moment in someone's speech, it's probably not an appropriate thing to start a what chant 
or to, you know, if somebody is praising their husband, I remember that debacle of, of Trish Stratus's induction speech. And she mentioned her husband, Ron, I think his, her name is, or his name is, and uh, just, it was embarrassing. There have been a lot of embarrassing moments like that. And I've said before that I would love for them to take those Hall of Fame ceremonies back to the olden days when they used to have them in a banquet hall or like a giant conference room or auditorium room at a hotel. And so if you have any fans there at all, it's a lot smaller and more intimate. Uh, that is if you even have fans there in the first place. I would be perfectly fine with that if they did that. Now, I know why they won't, because they make money off it. They can fill, you know, ten or 15,000 seats. And as, uh, as we have learned recently, and I'm going to get into this shortly when I talk about Saudi Arabia... Uh, it's all about money, and that's really the only thing, everything else be damned, and that is the only thing that matters to this company. Three hours of Raw going to burn out our audience? Shit, we're going to get $50 million. Who cares? You know, Hall of Fame uh, being, uh, you know, ruined by a couple of jackasses? Well, who cares? We can sell tickets. That's That's all they care about. That's the only language they speak. I give them credit. It was a nice, intimate venue, if nothing else. Uh, a little noisy because you had people who were not there for the Hall of Fame in the background eating and, and drinking, so you had that. Um, but I'm not going to shit on them for that. I actually like it when they do events like this that are smaller uh, and more intimate. Uh, now, there were a couple of LOL TNA moments. Uh, I, can't, I can't not mention this. I was told that the venue did know they did know that impact was hosting an event upstairs that's good they at least were, were aware of that but what they apparently were not aware of and i i learned this uh as soon as i arrived um what they were not aware of until last night the night of the event was that they were selling tickets that impact was selling tickets which they were to the hall of fame the bar did not know that and naturally when they found out they wanted a piece of that. Uh, now, I don't know how that was resolved or anything like that, but I, I was, <laughs> I mean, I guess I shouldn't have been shocked, but I was when I was told this. I'm standing there thinking, how do you not coordinate something like that with the venue? Like, you know, I've organized half a dozen events of my own, little casual meetups. I mean, I've done, you know, some event planning with my, my day job as well, but just in terms of the podcast, I've organized half a dozen events of my own. I'm actually organizing event number seven right now. And I make sure to always work with the venue to make sure that things are organized properly. Now, granted, I don't charge you guys for admission like they were doing last night, but if I did, I would make sure to alert the venue. That just seems like common sense to me. So when I got there, you know, I was there with Webmaster Mike. Shout out to Webmaster Mike and SE Scoops. Uh, when I got there, you know, he, he, was, he was already there waiting. The manager... He looked completely flustered as people were showing up. Uh, they were not letting anybody initially when we got there. They weren't letting anybody upstairs to where the, the ceremony was about to take place. Even though I paid for our tickets. <laughs> you had to pay to get into this Hall of Fame thing. Now, whatever it was, I paid 20, what did I pay? 25, 30 bucks, something like that. But they had already been letting people upstairs because I guess the bar didn't know. They weren't, there weren't security people there. There weren't security checking tickets. So they were letting everybody upstairs. And in fact, now that I think about it, they never bothered to check our tickets either. So sucks for me, I guess. Had I known that I could just waltz on in for free, <laughs> believe me, I happily would have done so. I could have taken that 30 bucks and gotten myself two Jack and Cokes for that. That's like me spending $10 a month like a schmuck like I do for the WWE Network when tons of people just get it for free. What a, what a great feeling that is, right? Uh, but Ed Nordholm was there, Don Callis was there, Scott Demore was there, uh, a good part of the Impact roster. Josh Matthews, he was holding court as the master of ceremonies, and he looked <laughs> he looked like he'd been uh, hitting the loggers a little early, I'll just say that. Now maybe he was just very emotional to see his friend being inducted into the Hall of Fame. That is possible, but I can you can kind of tell when somebody's been... Uh, loosening up a little bit even some of the wrestlers we were sitting you know probably four rows in we're just sitting amongst the wrestlers tessa blanchard is sitting next to us but like i'm even some of the wrestlers i like turned to look i thought maybe i was the only one who realized this and they were sort of 
I don't know. They were laughing. It kind of felt like they picked up on the same vibe that I was. Uh, so look, I have no idea if he was bombed or not, but his eyes were so glassy I could practically see my reflection. And I was four rows back. Father James Mitchell, he did the induction. Uh, he was the perfect choice. To me, he was the only choice, really. It would be like having uh, Paul Bear, if he were still alive, inducting The Undertaker or Kane. Uh, there are just certain acts that are together for so long that it just makes sense that somebody like that would be the one to do the induction. Plus, I mean, the guy, I mean, for God's sakes, the guy was born with a voice to be a pro wrestler or, or a narrator or something. He sounds, I mean, now he sounds like he gargles concrete uh, when he speaks, but even still, the guy's got an amazing voice. So he was the perfect choice to do the induction. He shared a lot of stories about what it was like when he was first put together with Abyss and being on the road with him. Abyss, during his speech, told actually a really funny story uh, about, you know, wondering many years ago how Mitchell gets his eyebrows. Like, the guy literally looks like the living embodiment of the devil incarnate. And he's got those, those eyebrows that go up. And he couldn't figure out, how do you get your eyebrows to do that? And they were in Mitchell's, you know, truck riding to the next town. And he's, uh, he says to Abyss, he goes... You know, check, what was it, like, check my pocket or something, something like that. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a, a loaded gun. And Mitchell was like, oh, wrong pocket. He's like, here, see on the floor, reach down and grab that. And he picks up a glue stick, like the ones you would use in school. And so literally that was, that was the trick. He takes a glue stick and he basically glues his eyebrows up. And that's how he was able to get them to look like that. So I thought that was, uh, that was amusing. But Abyss, you know, Abyss is just, uh, he's just a nice guy. He comes across as the nicest guy in the world. He really comes across as somebody who I think would be a, an absolute asset to whatever company he's in. Obviously, he's older now. His body is, is very beat up. I mean, he's a hardcore wrestler. So you look at the punishment that he's put himself through, all the, the barbed wire and the thumbtacks. I mean, you know, what Mick Foley put his body through, this this was similar. You know, in, in TNA for all those years, he was sort of that Mick Foley figure, you know, in the company. He was the one that was putting himself through hell to, at a lot of times to put other people over. I mean, he was NWA champion at one point. I think Abyss, they said, has held every major singles title in the company. Uh, so he had plenty of success, but, you know, he worked with a lot of guys and, and he would want to make them look good. And he worked with everybody. He worked with Sting. He worked with Kurt Angle. He worked with Mick Foley. He was working alongside Hulk Hogan uh, for a while. And it was nice because the video package they did for him, I got to say, was really A+. Uh, and I hope they played that on the live stream on Twitch that I guess they had last night because it was really well done. Uh, they even had comments in there, current updated comments from Kurt Angle and from Mick Foley congratulating Abyss on going into the Hall of Fame. Uh, nothing from Hogan but or, or Sting. But uh, Jeff Jarrett was also... Uh, briefly featured. He had comments as well. The same Jeff Jarrett who is currently suing Anthem. So that was awkward. And he did get some boos when he first popped up on screen. Although it wasn't Ed Nordholm, I don't think, starting the boos. Uh, but he thanked, he thanked everybody Abyss did during his speech. It was, it was just a really cool moment. You could tell how, how deeply it touched him. You could talk about the venue and you can talk about haha -ha Impact and how come he never went to WWE... And Mitchell told that story, it wasn't, was it Mitchell? I don't know if it was, um, no, you know what, it wasn't James Mitchell, it might have been Scott Demore, who, who also said there was a point around 2006 or so where they thought that Abyss was gone. He was going up north, he was going to WWE. And there was a pay-per-view and he showed up and they, you know, had him make a surprise return and they knew at that point that this guy was all in. He was like Mr. TNA, he was just very loyal to that company probably more than he should have been there was probably a lot of things and you know, there's been a lot of stories over the years of guys not getting paid or getting paid on time and a lot of the other political bullshit that was going on he probably deserved better than he got to be perfectly honest with you it is kind of sad he never had the chance to get like a big run in wwe but that was wwe's loss and and tna's gain now he's working even in a backstage capacity and a creative role and he's a mentor to a lot of the younger talent. It was it was really cool to see him get all emotional because you could tell how much it meant to him. This wasn't just a gimmick. This wasn't just, you know, hey, let's just have a quick little thing and it's not a big deal. You could tell to him it was a very big deal. For real. Legit. And so that was very cool. 
Austin Aries. Let's let's get into what uh, happened here at the end. Austin Aries did show up. He showed up late, quote unquote, late. Took a seat in the front row, right next to Abyss, separated from Johnny Impact only by Abyss. Abyss was sitting between them. And as soon as the ceremony was over and Abyss wrapped up his speech, Aries, in an impromptu fashion, he got up, he grabbed the microphone, and yeah, Josh Matthews was being a little a little over the top with it. Uh, as far as his his reactions and mannerisms to everything that was going on. Uh, but everybody else was playing it very straight, like, hey, what's going on here? Come on, this is, you know, not your time. And Aries was just very contrite, and he was almost sheepish. And he wanted to, he said some very nice things about Abyss, and then he transitioned into the whole thing that happened with uh, Johnny Impact, because the two of them went back and forth on Twitter, uh, earlier in the week, and there were some very nasty things that were said on both sides. But Aries made a comment also about, you know, Taya being husky, and then he took the tweets down, and there was a big backlash against Aries for it. And people said, well, it sounds like it was real, but it just went too far, or, you know, is it is it a work, is it a shoot? And so he said, I came here, I also wanted to apologize, because there were some tweets that I made, and I've taken them down, and blah, blah, blah. And he mentioned, he goes, but then I saw that Johnny and Taya went on TMZ Live and they basically trashed me. And that's when the shit hit the fan. And pandemonium broke out and Johnny Impact, you know, he stood up and he was shouting. He wanted to go after Aries. He had to be restrained. I guess that's also where the live Twitch feed cut out. Uh, but this went on for several minutes after. They had to be pulled apart. They never came to blows. Uh, but there was plenty of cussing and trash talking going on, and Aries dropped about, you know, half a dozen F-bombs. Uh, now, Johnny, he did throw a bag. I think it was I think it was the bag that Aries came in with. It might have been like a little backpack or a purse or I don't know. But he chucked that thing across the bar. I think it hit somebody in the head. Uh, so that did happen. But anyway, I put the video of all this up on my uh, Twitter, and... Uh, I'm going to play it again for you when I put this clip up on YouTube. When I chop up the clips and I put them on the YouTube channel, I'll make sure I put the actual video in there at the end so you guys can see it. Now, look, everyone, I, I couldn't believe on my timeline how many people still, even this morning, are chiming in, oh, was it a work, or that looked real, or, well, obviously that was a work. Which is funny when people say that, because if you if you know that it is, you wouldn't have that little <laughs> that little twinge of doubt, you know. I could practically hear it uh, in, in your tweets when you post them. This has gotten quite the reaction. This has worked out exactly the way that Impact wanted it to. This was all designed to promote their match tonight at Bound for Glory and get a buzz going, just like the tweets were. Now, look, tweets can get out of hand. Is it possible that they were tweeting things and it just escalated and, and it did get to a point where they had to be pulled back a little bit because they were getting a little too personal? Sure. I don't know that that's what happened here. I think everything from day one with this has been a work, but it's been a very well done work. Uh, they've been playing off this, this perception of Austin Aries as being a dick in real life, right? Those stories have been around for a long time. It's not too far off to think that Aries would behave this way. And clearly they've been playing off of that, and I think they've done a masterful job at it. And last night was no different. I just love that even today in 2018, as cynical as we can all be, right? And everybody thinks they know everything. Even to, even to this day, they are still able to make you stop and go, was that real? Did that really just happen? Well, well certainly this was, this was not real, but that was real, right? Uh, I love that 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 still happens even today because it feels like you know kayfabe has been dead for so long, um, and it's hard to do, you know, in an age where news leaks and everybody thinks they know everything, and uh, we hear about things that you never would have heard about, you know, fifteen twenty years ago. It's hard to believably pull off something like that, and I feel like they did that last night. This was a classic pro wrestling angle, uh, but if you needed any any clarification on whether or not it was, uh, <laughs> you know. If it was on the up and up or not, I looked over to my left, and there's Ed Nordholm, right? Basically the owner of, of the company. As this was going on, and, and they're cursing, and they're, you know, they're destroying furniture and things, and there's Ed Nordholm off to the side with, like, a, a smile or a grin on his face, filming the whole thing with his, with his smartphone. There are certain things, if you really watch closely, should have been a dead giveaway for you. Uh, and not just the way that uh, Josh Matthews was acting either. Although maybe that was the loggers, I don't know. Uh, this was this was their version, I guess, of Connor and Habib coming off that last uh, UFC show. 
And like I said, I think they did a good job with it. Now, when uh, we were leaving, I went downstairs. I went to go use the men's room before we left. And uh, I opened the door then to leave. There's Eli Drake. I, I'm like, all right, it's all yours. And as I'm walking out of the bar, here comes Aries. Now, Aries supposedly had been, uh, you know, pulled to the back and kicked out of the venue. But here he is, you know, he's got a drink in his hand very casually, you know, strolling over to the bar. <laughs> it, I guess that's his reward for a job well done. We'll see if it translates into buys for Bound for Glory. I think it may be too late for that, uh, given that the event now is uh, is coming up tonight. Although online, it has gotten a lot of... There's been a lot of buzz for this online. The video that I put up got something already like 13,000 views or something. And my timeline, I woke up this morning, there were a shitload of messages. So they got people talking. This is something that Impact has not been able to do for a very long time. And maybe one of the reasons why they have just not been able to sort of, I don't know, it feels like they're in a rut right now. Not in terms of, of the product itself, which I hear people praising all the time. Oh, it's so much better. It's so good. Give it a chance. They just can't get any momentum going, it feels like. So it's smart for them to, to try something like this. And it did work. I just don't know if it'll, like I said, translate into buys for the pay-per-view, which is kind of the whole point of this. For me, though, it worked fine. Got me excited to see that match. So I just think also, and a lot of you guys said this, and I think it's an important point to make, that people are just so starved for this type of thing in WWE, or WWE is the only thing they watch, and so they don't they don't see stuff like this. And when they do, they like it. And they think it's cool, right? Blurring the lines between fantasy and reality. So it was a breath of fresh air, I think, for a lot of people. 